Hey, I'm Rob Berger. When I'm not rolling in the dough, that's right, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and anyone else excited for all of the 2020 motivational puns and trendy buzzwords we'll get this year? Heck, it's time to kick out a few industry disruptors, synergies, and even digital nomad in favor of words more apt for the year. More on that later, because you don't need 2020 vision to know our featured guest today is going to bring it. We're talking to Brian Karimzad, CEO of Magnify Money, on the best strategies to wash away your debt. Plus, we'll work up a win-win situation or two during today's headlines. We'll discuss Vanguard cutting more fees and share how the average 401k plan fared in 2019. Later, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to James, who wonders about choosing top funds in different sectors and investing in them. Is that a good strategy? Ha! And don't worry, of course, we'll still save time for some of my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are ready to make a deep dive into their core competency and make a huge impact, Joe and O J J J J G. Time for us to think outside the box, man going to bring it today as long as we're thinking win-win we're gonna we're gonna drop some knowledge bombs on a monday hey everybody welcome to proactive stacking benjamin show i am joe salci hi here at the card table with my buddy og for another monday i was talking to somebody who's trying to get my business maybe about six months ago and she said yeah i'm just gonna drop a couple knowledge bombs on you i'm like oh god please don't I was thinking maybe when we get done with this, we could sharpen the saw. See, I don't mind. That's Stephen Covey. That's different. That's like 201. <laughs> maybe but not. She was going to she was gonna flex with some knowledge bombs. So. With, with some knowledge bombs. Yes. Right. You know the way you get knowledge bombs from time to time? I'm fairly certain you're going to tell me. You subscribe to the stacker. The stacker uh, comes out when it comes out. But you know what? It is a bunch <laughs> of financial lessons. You like how I, like how I changed that? It is a bunch of financial lessons and everything going on in the basement for you to keep up with what we're doing here at Stacking Benjamins, all the news as we travel and we're getting geared up for 2020 travel, all of our meetups, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. We got a great show today. We have Brian Krumzad from Magnify Money. This is always- Never heard of him. (laughs) Magnify What? Huh? Never heard of it. What? Uh, W-U-T. What? Should be, should be a sad time for some people, but we're going to rescue them, OG. People getting their credit card statements now going, I did what? I heard that. I actually have a really good story about a Christmas surprise on a credit card statement. So maybe we'll talk about that later. (laughs) No. Well, first we have some headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Well, it's that time of year, OG, the time when uh, countless publications start telling us about what happened last year, regurgitating. Actually, you didn't participate in the year. (laughs) In a lot of ways, uh, looking back and maybe giving us some knowledge, dropping some knowledge bombs Mm -hmm. on us. I know we're we're going to say that like 67 times today. This is. from Napa Dashnet, the National Association of Plan Advisors, that written by Nevin Adams. How did the average 401k fare in 2019? Let's dive into that. A year ago, the average 401k balance went into 2019 with a bit of a hangover. This year, the hangover could be for a different reason. It's easy to forget that in December 2018, the markets were so rough that the average 401k account balance for younger, less tenured workers shed nearly 5%, 4.9% for the month, which means the losses were large enough to overwhelm the positive impact of contributions. Indeed, a steep sell-off in December of 2018 left the S&P 500 just 0.2% from officially hitting a bear market defined as a 20% drop off its peak, ending 2018 with a loss of more than 6%, closing it. Uh, yeah, we, we don't need to go into all those numbers. 
I mean, somebody's run Thank along. You. Well, if somebody's run along the trail, do they want to know that uh, it closed at two thousand four hundred eighty-five point seven four? Remember that, Mister Jogger. But that, as they say, was then, according to estimates from the nonpartisan Employee Benefit Research Institute. December 2019 saw the average 401k account balance for younger, 25 to 34, less tenured, one to four years, worker surge 3.3%. For older, age 55 to 64, workers with more than 20 years of tenure, whose average balance is generally more influenced by market moves than contributions, the average 401k balance rose 2%. Those Q4 statements should bear some good tidings as well. The youngest least tenured cohort uh, rose 10%. Remember that those balances strongly are influenced by contribution flows because these are the least tenured people. Older, more tenured people climbed 5.8%. Great time for people's 401k, OG. That's more money that you can take out as a 401k loan (laughs) for a backyard remodel. The shock is, I'm sure Brian who's upstairs talking to mom right now is not going to probably bring that advice. No, you don't think so? No, no, maybe not. But here's the other thing too. I think it's really important to notice if you have a financial plan that you created, let's say the beginning of 19 and you were realistic with your assumptions, you might've selected an 8% return for the year. You might've said 9% or seven or six and a half or 10, whatever. And so you're looking at your investment balance and you're looking at the fact that the projection that you had for the year was dwarfed by what actually happened. I mean, as long as you kind of sort of played the game a little bit, you probably had a 20% year. So if you're betting on seven for your plan and you came away with 20, you're almost three years ahead of schedule. But remember that also equates to volatility and volatility is that side of the pendulum just as much as it is the other side of the pendulum. Right. So It's great. It's awesome that you might be two or three years ahead of your goal. But just remember that this time next year, we might be talking about a 20% loss and you might be back to even money as it relates to your goals. And so I caution everybody to just, you know, we've had, gosh, 10, 11 years of really good returns. And especially the last year, which was really strong. Just remember, just because you're ahead today doesn't mean you're going to be, you're going to be ahead tomorrow. So as much emphasis as you want to put on this now is as much as you're going to have to put on it when it goes the other way as well. So, uh, I want to caution people against something else too. You feel like when you're ahead that you need to quote lock in those returns, right? By doing what? By changing mm-hmm. the plan, by selling. And with all the, and we're recording this a couple of days before it goes live, obviously. And there might be a lot of news that happens between now and Monday morning, but with all the Middle East tension going on right now, OG, I think there's some people, well, you're seeing it right on Friday with the market all over the place on Friday. You're seeing some people, quote, moving to safer places. I don't. How should you react to that? There's nothing safer about a treasury if you have a long-term goal. That's right. How is that? How is that safer toward reaching a long-term goal? You're going to safely never get anywhere by doing that. It will be very comfortable. It will very comfortably run out of money in your mid-70s. And gold, by the way, big run on gold on Friday. What the hell are you thinking? Eight times more volatility in the stock market. That's what I'm going to do. Makes a lot of sense to me. That's safer. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you yeah. talking about? It's so crazy to me seeing what, what, what people do. I mean, I understand the fear some people have. Feeling the fear is okay. Acting on it in dumb ways just just drives you crazy. It feels like you have to do something. You know what I mean? Like when something goes on, like the craziness that that was last week in the Middle East, it feels like you should act in some way. It feels like you must be required to do some sort of uh, action. And the, and the reality is that a lot of times doing nothing is the best action. Stay the course. If you have a goal that that is coming due next Thursday. Well, guess what? You're dumb for having it be in the market anyway. Shouldn't have been there. (laughs) You know, if you have a goal that comes due in six months from now, you're dumb for having it be in the market anyway. But if you're 37 and you're dumping $19,500 in your 401k and you're going, well, how should my allocation change? Because of, you know, insert whatever calamity you're talking about. 
The answer is it shouldn't. You still have 30 years for crying out loud. And then after that, you have 30 more years. <laughs> Your time horizon is forever. So, um, you know. I uh, And for people that are new to the show and really don't understand why we're saying that's dumb, here's the reasoning. It's kind of like a farmer who plants a crop. You plant at a certain time of year and then you harvest at another time of year. If it's January out and you plant corn right now in the northern hemisphere, nothing's going to happen. All your corn's going to die. If you try to pull out corn a month after you plant it, it's not going to be ready and you're going to kill it. So different investments have different time frames. They work well over. And when you remove the investment early, you then have to try to put it back in the ground. Take take a stalk of corn or take a piece of grass or whatever, leave it outside the the warm confines of the earth for just a few days and try to put that back in. Yeah. You're going to kill it. You're going to kill your own thing. You can't put toothpaste back in the tube. (laughs) See how many analogies we can get. See all these knowledge Knowledge bombs. bombs. (laughs) Knowledge bombs. So we got to go. It's It's like a bath bomb, but way better. Yeah. Don't, don't, please don't do that. How many bath bombs do you take on a, in a week? Would you say on average? (laughs) Look at it. Like, I don't know. I should answer this in any way, shape or form. I don't know about bath bombs. I've made bathroom bombs, but I think that might be a different thing. Is that a different thing? thing. Yeah. I try not to do it in the bath though. That's kind of disgusting. (laughs) I stay away from that. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. Gee, this is a family show. Uh, Our second headline comes to us from investment news. Vanguard, (laughs) Vanguard eliminates trading fees for stocks and options. This is written by Jeff. First mover advantage. Yeah, this is written by Jeff Benjamin. In this case, the 27th mover advantage. The Vanguard group, which was ahead of the curve in 2018 when eliminated trading commissions on most exchange traded funds, kicked off the new year by extending commission free online trading for stocks and options for all Vanguard brokerage clients. The change, which was effective Thursday, January 2nd, described as, quote, just another day at Vanguard by Andrew Kajeski, head of retail trading, quote, We've been doing this on the brokerage side for the past decade, he added, referencing commission-free trading of Vanguard ETFs since 2010. This is interesting, though, G. The reason I bring this to the table is Vanguard made a lot of noise about leading the charge when it came to fees. But when it came to this stock stuff, I feel like they kind of got dragged to the table, don't you? I mean, this is late enough that when you saw TD Ameritrade after Charles Schwab was the first mover, you saw TD Ameritrade respond, and then you had E-Trade respond, and then Fidelity responded. You had all these big firms that made the move, and then, you know, Vanguard, a couple months later, I have, goes, I have a different yeah, perspective on this. Do you? I have a different perspective on this. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I recognize, and I think most people would agree, that, I'm using air quotes, Wall Street knows how to make money, Right. The folks that run Wall Street always make money. The folks that run all of these investment companies know how to make money. On the other side of the coin, the action that happens when you trade a stock online costs something to do. I don't know what it costs. I don't know if it costs four dollars and ninety-five cents. I don't know if it's a dollar ninety-five. I don't know if it costs thirty to two ninety-five. But the infrastructure to provide the support of that transaction, right? If you go on Fidelity and you type in buy 10 shares Apple, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in order to make sure that that manifests itself in the correct way. And so one of the ways that companies made money or offset costs, depending on how you look at it, is they charge for that. They charge a certain amount. And now they're not charging for that anymore, So that leads me to think one of two things. Either A, it was all purely profit, which if you look at like a publicly traded company like Charles Schwab, you can see that they have operating costs. So so it can't totally be pure profit. There has to be something in there. So I wonder if the downside of this is potentially more hidden costs. I wonder if the downside of it is less quality uh, execution execution of the service that you're trying to get, uh, less innovation, 
you know, because obviously companies use profit in different ways. Some of it's rewarded shareholders and the owners, and some of it is to reinvest in the organization and add more innovation. That's one of the big struggles that people are talking about with the Schwab TD Ameritrade merger is that because they were such great competitors, they kept each other's game up as it relates to technology. And with one person going away, does that stifle innovation? So I'm just kind of curious, you know, this has always been plugged as a real positive for consumers, right? Hey, I don't have to pay my $4 trading costs anymore or formerly $10 trading costs or before that $25 trading costs. Before right? that 100 right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it used to be freaking 6%, you yeah. know, of whatever the amount was. But I wonder what the other side of that coin is. You know what I mean? Like, Where's it coming from? We have to recognize that it definitely does cost something the fact that you can log into a website, pull up your account, the data is correct. There's a phone number for you to call if you don't like it. You know, you know what I mean? Like that, all of that stuff, that technology, that infrastructure, all of that costs something to manufacture and produce. And we took away this cost offset slash revenue stream from these companies. So where does that come out at? I just, Are you I'm trying curious. to say that there will not be a free lunch? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, now that you put it that way, it really makes me sound like a total jack. But <laughs> it's nice of you to put it in that context. But but, um, but it is true. It is true that there won't be a free lunch. I mean, it always these companies know how to make money. Heck, Vanguard knows how to make money. All these companies hmm. know how to make money. So I get you. And it'll be interesting to see what's next, right? And it'll clearly be hidden. Nobody's going to have... Nobody's going to have a... Nobody's uh, coming out with the $99.99. <laughs> They're not going to do a trade, big marketing push up. to announce to everybody that we made wire transfer fees go up by 10 bucks. <laughs> they didn't do that. They also didn't say yet. that Marge on the telephone desk lost her job yesterday because of the fact that I had zero trades and now you're going to wait on hold for 15 minutes instead of five, right? They're not going to have a big thing about that. But you do wonder what comes next. But I still feel I just get, this doesn't seem late to you for Vanguard to come to the table this late. I mean, you knew they were going to have to sooner or later, but it just seems I don't know. I mean, the big scheme of things, we're going to look at this 10 years later and go, yeah, it was Schwab in what, September, early October and bam, by January, Vanguard had done it, too. But over the short run here, it feels like everybody went at once and then I'm leafing through investment news. Seriously, when I read this at the first, you know, what my first thought was shut the cover to see what the date of the magazine was. Yeah. Yeah. My first thought was they haven't done that yet. Yeah. Well, well maybe that's the point. They didn't do it for so long that they're like, oh, well, whatever. Yeah, maybe. I think that's a good takeaway, though. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And it's funny because people think there is a free lunch. This is another way to spin this. People think there is a free lunch. I just hire less advice, right? Or I use a suboptimal thing or I do it all myself. There's still a time cost. There's still the chance that you might make a mistake. Like there's a cost of everything. Everything mm -hmm. is a cost. There's always a cost, I think, is our number one takeaway. Our number two takeaway is uh, that 401k did pretty well. Probably time Back for remodel time. <laughs> Or, or maybe not. Please don't do that. Brian Krimzad has been a guy that we've known for a long, long time. He has been at the helm of Magnify Money along with our friend Nick Clements for quite a while. We've had Nick on the show usually doing this segment every year helping people get out of debt oh gee this is this is the time of year when there's more interest in our show than any other time of year and there's people trying to get ahead but there's also people going man i gotta write the ship i gotta write the ship mm -hmm. so our goal today to help you out get the man who knows more about this than anybody else we know brian Krimzad coming down the basement to help us with the debt claims And here, back for repeat appearance. I can't believe he's been here all weekend. <laughs> Brian Kreemzad from Magnified Money joins us again. How are you, man? I'm well. I, I want to thank your mom for her hospitality. In case the listeners don't know, his mom is actually looking to earn some more income 
in the new year and, and opened up uh, an Airbnb upstairs in, in Joe's old childhood bedroom. So I, I was her guest this weekend. And I just had to tell her, I, I, I had to tell her three times though, that you were the guest of honor, Brian, and not to charge you like three times. I had to remind her. <laughs> well, uh, it was charged up front and there was a hundred dollar cleaning fee that uh, she said was applicable to all guests. But, um, there was plenty of native deodorant available in, in the bathroom. So I appreciate that. <laughs> that's why, that's why Doug does the windows. So he doesn't have to pay that cleaning fee. Uh, except don't tell him this. He pays the hundred bucks because it's a cleaning fee because he has to clean and pay the hundred bucks. So he gets to clean. You know what I mean? It's a promotional, <laughs> yeah, he gets promotional thing. Hey, uh, th this time of year with you, and with, uh, with Nick before you, we always talk about debt cleanse. And it's why do we always seem to kick off January by going, oh, crap? Boy, you know, you could say in good terms, it's because we're all more careful in January. We really want to be introspective and we want to take stock of our lives. That's what they'll tell you on the media. The reality is you just spend a lot of money in December, right? You know, we, we had all the gifts, we had the holiday parties, we had a, maybe a week and a half off work, so we didn't quite get the paycheck we were expecting. The holiday bonus might not come until, you know, or the annual bonus usually doesn't come until January or February, so we're kind of spending that before it comes, and we don't know exactly what it's going to be. You might have had to have your kids in daycare for a few days while they were out of school on, on the beginning of a winter break. It all adds up when you get into November and December and, you know, all it takes is $20 a day of overspending and you're in $10,000 in debt over the course of less than two years. So January is, is the peak month for people searching for relief from debt. And it's because that's when debt tends to peak. You know, you look at the, the statistics that uh, the Fed puts out on credit card balances and you can imagine they peak right as we get into January because all of those uh, holiday credit card bills come due. And some of us find that, you know what, uh, the checking account isn't going to cover the whole thing this month. So we may have to let it slide for a month, two, or unfortunately, in, in a decent number of cases uh, over the course of a year or more. And that, that's what we try to help. And in uh fact, if you, you look at the numbers, we, we've done a survey over the last several years of people who get into debt over the holidays, we found on average people get into debt, it's over $1,000. The end of 2018, it was uh, $1,230. And about 35% of Americans say they, they rack up debt that they can't immediately pay off over the holidays. So there's no shame in it. You know, it, it happens to the best of us. Um, you know, we live month to month thinking every month's gonna be the same. And you know, when December comes around, that's when it doesn't add up and, and we have to do some work. I've talked about this extensively before, but not for a long time. So new listeners to the show may not know that I was a financial dumpster fire, Brian, back, back in the day, back early, early, early in my financial life. And uh, I remember Cheryl and I, one of the first years we were together, my credit had already been destroyed. I had one credit card left. It was a Hudson's. Remember Hudson's, which is now oh, part yeah. of Macy's? Hudson, was, they, I thought that was Canadian, but I guess you all in Michigan have That's them, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. They <laughs> came down like the snow. All right. Uh, Dayton Hudson. That's right. It was Dayton's in Minnesota. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we had one card left. It was Dayton Hudson, which now if you think Nordstrom or Macy's or something of that caliber, and, yep. it, and it was a thousand dollars of credit. We had no money. We had young kids and we did a Dayton Hudson Christmas where whatever they, <laughs> whatever we had, they had in their marketplace section, we bought full well knowing, by the way, full well knowing that that was just going to get us deeper into credit card debt. I didn't know how I was going to pay it off. I didn't know anything except we wanted to make it a quote, nice Christmas. And now the future me thinks it would have been a much nicer Christmas. Had I just gone, you know what, let's just tell everybody that we can't do it. Like it would have been way better, but no, no. I'm sure there's lots of people listening or people listening in a similar situation, you know, just didn't oh, yeah, know where I, to turn. I remember when I was a kid, there was, there, you know, the tradition was for aunts and uncles from, from both sides to, to buy gifts for each other. So not just for the kids, but for the adults. And then, then one Chris, I think it was the Christmas of 86, <laughs> kind of stands out in your head. Um, they all came to an agreement that they wouldn't buy gifts for each other. Um, 
and I'm guessing it was, you know, the Christmas of 85 was a pretty, pretty heady one. And they, uh, they learned their lesson there and, and decided to, to go a leaner route. And fortunately, everyone's turned out well over the long term in our family on that front. What percentage are the visits up at Magnify Money in January over December? It's got to be huge. Like, I don't know if you guys double or triple the amount of people coming to the site. Well, you know, our, our corporate owners don't like us to talk uh, specifics about that, but right. I would say it is a significant bump of traffic yeah. Yeah. in January for us and, and across uh, personal finance because people are they're looking for answers and they're looking for options to uh, to cut that debt as fast as they can. It's I, just like the, the Nutrisystem and the Weight Watchers in January. Yeah. You know, they, they go nuts this month. Well, and even for me, when I was a financial planner, it was the same thing. January was a packed month for me. Everybody yeah. decided, you know what, I'm going to get my act together. So same stuff. So let's look at two things then, Brian. Let's look at short-term fixes, and then let's talk about long-term fixes. You know, I used to talk about when I was a planner, I'd talk about the leaves of the tree and taking care of those versus the root of the problem. But the first thing I think is a little bit of arbitrage, right, or a little bit of triage. Let's stop the bleeding. How do we do that over the short term? to get rid of some of this mess that I might've made in November and December? You know, the, the first thing you should do is just add up your debt, just the total amount of the debt, real simple. Doesn't have to be an exact to the dollar calculation, but just get round numbers and then divide it by what your income is, what you think you're going to make uh, or what you made last year, you know, is good enough. If that's more than 75%, you probably need to consider professional help. That's a pretty rough zone, and not a lot of people are in that zone. That's probably less than 5% of people who are in debt. If that number is 50 to 75%, you're in the gray zone, probably worth getting in touch with a reputable nonprofit counselor uh, or, or an financial advisor, as you used to be, just to talk through it. You, you need so, you're going to need someone to at least walk through your options. If it's below 50%, that's where you're in the self-help zone and where you can start thinking about things you can do right now and, and act pretty quickly. Before you act, you want to get a look at your credit score. So you just understand what your score is. You can look at our, our parent company, Lending Trees app, and they'll give you your score instantly. There's a whole other lots of places that'll give that for you for free. Generally, if your score is above 650, you're going to have options. You'll have things that you can do right away to lower your payment, get a lower interest rate if you're responsible. Now, I would say before you do any of that, and your listeners are great. I mean, your, your listeners are on the investment road. Most of the folks that are listening to this don't need this help, but you probably have a family member who does. So listen for them. You know, if it's above 650, just make sure that you're not overspending anymore. You kind of get that in check before you start doing any of these, these quick tricks. Because if you do uh, like a balance transfer and you're still spending more than you need, but you're going to have the Sizzler buffet problem, right? You know, you got a Sizzler, you want to have a steak dinner, put it on your plate, you bring it, you eat it. What do you do after your plate's empty? You go up and load up again with a second Absolutely. one, right? Where you go to a regular restaurant, you order your steak, you see the price for the next one, you're done. That's kind of how I look at the difference. I look at the option of transferring your debt. People usually think about transferring debt to get a lower rate. And that truly is the fastest way to get your payment down, you know, without actually paying it all off first. The problem is you open up an empty line of credit. When you get a loan with a lower rate, well, guess what? That means I'm going to move my credit card balance over to loan and I got all this $5,000 sitting in my credit card again. That's money I can spend, right? No. <laughs> Cut it up. You know, put it on ice. That's the biggest problem. You don't want that sizzler buffet problem with your credit lines. You want to, you want to close them off and, and let yourself really go on a spending diet. But tactically, you know, a 0% balance transfer is, is the best deal around. There are some, a few, not a lot that have absolutely no fees up front. Uh, you can go to magnifymoney.com and there is a balance transfer calculator and selection. That'll show you all your options, the ones with a fee without. Just punch in your uh, your credit card debt you want to transfer and it'll give you the best rates and what your savings are. The ones with no fee are really attractive because you don't really lose anything by playing with them. Yeah, there's, Again, no, there's no downside. Well, the, well it, up front. Now, right. the reason the credit card companies offer them is because they're hoping that someone's going to flip. That you transfer that balance, and then after 18 months, you still have $4,000 left on it. And after that, that $4,000 is going to start accruing interest at whatever the standard APR is, which is usually you know, 15, 18, even 25%, depending on your, your credit worthiness. So 
that's the key. You got to be really disciplined and it's, it's usually good to do it, you know, have an accountability partner. So if you're a listener on this show, you know, someone who needs some help, be frank with them, be in a no judgment zone and, and help them tackle that balance transfer in a safe way. Because if you do it yourself, I, I can see it's, it's easy to get trapped into, you know, a surprise next Christmas and, and loading up the card. And I can't, I can't tell you, by the way, the number of people back to your previous point about you got to stop using the card when you transfer the balance off of it. You got to stop. I can't tell you how many people I met with Brian that did that very thing by doing it. I mean, they transferred the balance and Hey, I've got free money. And it's funny because you don't really look at it that way. You look at it as, Oh, I have just this one extra thing. I'm just this one time going to go back to the card. And I think it's because our brain's a little lazy. I think we know we have that money available. And because we know we have it available, we don't think hard about the question. We're like, hey, I, I, I just transferred that balance. Now I got more money. Yeah, you got more money and your monthly payment doesn't change a lot when you add new spending on it, right? Yeah. Because that monthly payment, it's you know less than 2% of your outstanding balance. Uh, you don't, it's harder to notice. You get kind of sucked into looking at what that monthly minimum payment is on your uh on your statement. And that's the other trap. Please don't, don't listen to the minimum payment on your, on your car. This is, this is stuff, you know, that our day from Tennessee has been talking about since before 2007. <laughs> You're not learning anything new on this. <laughs> so that's the short term. When I move money over, look for no fee up front to move it. Maybe there's a promotional rate to move it. I look at two different things. There's consolidation loans And then there are balance transfer credit cards. Which one do you like better or are better ones different for different people? Yeah, it's different situations. So the balance transfer is more for really disciplined people. You got to be very disciplined and pay attention when you're dealing with a balance transfer because it's designed to trick people and probably a strong language, but it it expects that people will mess up. That's how the business model works on that. Yeah. A personal loan gets you on a fixed monthly payment so that at the end of that loan, the entire thing is paid off. So it forces you into the discipline of making a payment that's truly going to pay down your principal, right? You you don't have an option to make a minimum monthly payment that's not going to be paying down any material amount of principal. You're actually going to make real dents in it over the course of those two, three years, whatever term you, you use. The downside is your monthly payment is going to be higher because you know, you're know you putting more money towards principal each month than your option on a credit card where, yeah, you, you could in theory let it slide without touching the principal and you're at zero percent. So you're better off than you were if you had that minimum payment on a higher rate, but you're really not fixing the problem, right? You're just hoping to roll it over again, which is, <laughs> that's what a lot of companies do in this low rate environment. That's another conversation for another time with another guest. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about credit card companies and financial companies kind of trying to trick people a lot. You've mentioned that a couple of times. Is the only trap you see people fall into a lot of the time this minimum payment issue? Or are there other traps you see that credit card companies kind of set for consumers? Or maybe they don't even set them, Brian. Maybe it's a trap people have just because they're not thinking thoroughly about how to get out of debt the right way. Yeah, I mean, it, it plays on our you know, our desire to see nice, large numbers, right? Credit card companies like to celebrate when you get a credit line increase. I mean, it's a good thing, but is it something really worth getting excited and celebrating about it? <laughs> you know, right. right. You know, you do feel it, right. You know, you ask for it like, oh, wow, now my increase, my credit line has gone up $25,000, you know, <laughs> please don't use it all. <laughs> <You> know, it, <laughs> but it plays off our weaknesses, you know, in an indirect way. Let's put it that way. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's an outright trick. You know, there's a lot of regulations around these things and it's not the wild west that it was, you know, even as recently as the late nineties or even late two thousands, they're pretty clear disclosures now, right. You know, about, okay, if you only pay the minimum payment, here's how long it's going to take to pay off and, you know, making it clear that this is your option to pay the, the statement in full. So I think though, despite all that wisdom, you know, just accidents happen, people slip up. And we end up in in some debt. There's nothing to be ashamed about. It's just a matter of getting your spending under control if you can, and then getting the very lowest rates that you can to get there. And we we actually have, you know, we're known for helping you find very good savings and CD rates. But if you look at the top right corner of the site, there's a get debt free button. And there you can actually uh, download a 45 page guide that walks through all the steps that you can take to help yourself eliminate debt, regardless of your situation. So 
that's a great one if you know someone who you love who is in a bit of trouble and you're able to have that conversation you can have them read through it walk them through it and maybe revisit it every few months and that'll get them on a path to paying it off and understanding how to use the system in your favor because really what you're doing is taking advantage of the fact that banks want new customers those loan companies want new customers and you're almost always going to get a better deal by taking your debt as a customer of debt to another bank or another another loan company who's going to offer you a more attractive rate or terms how often we talked uh, on Friday when you w- were here and uh, we talked about Carter's question about interest rates back in 2007, 2008. I asked you then about looking at savings accounts, looking at interest rates on your debt, maybe thinking about moving your debt from place to place to lower interest rates. How often do you think yep. the average person should look at that? I think you should look at that about once a year. You know, interest rates on on your debt don't t- change quite as often. The the balance transfers, those can change monthly. So, I mean, there's some people who game those things, right? They're just constantly rolling them over. It used to be a thing, actually, back in the uh, 2000s when savings account rates were much higher. People would take the 0% balance transfer and they go park it in a savings account at, at 4 or 5% and take the spread. Uh, I don't recommend playing that game, but that's something that people used to do. But, rate, yeah, those, those rates and the terms change often. So, you know, hopefully – the one time you shop is the time that you really take care of it and you commit to putting whatever extra income you can behind paying off that debt and you don't have to shop around more. But that does if you still have it lingering after a year, it, it, it pays off to shop around at least once a year. People who are new to this game may be new to this argument I'm about to introduce, which is there's two different schools of thought. There is uh, start with the smallest balance and pay that down first. A lot of people call that the debt snowball. Dave from Tennessee talks a lot about that one behaviorally. <laughs> Math wizards, though, Brian, as you know, will tell you, heck with that, man. Look at, the, look at the interest rate that you're paying if you do it that way. Maybe you should pay off the highest interest rate first. People call that the debt avalanche method. Is there a better way? You know, it depends on on you and your personality. You know, Dave from Tennessee is homespun as it sounds. He has some wizards behind that too. There have actually been some academic studies that said people are more likely to get out of debt sooner, ironically, by following his method. You know, the smallest balances first because those quick wins keep you more disciplined and motivated to to keep at it. So you ultimately finish it. Tackling the largest debt if it has the lowest rate you might get discouraged because you don't see your balance moving as quickly. So it really depends on your personality. If you're someone who just has a short attention span, listen to Dave from Tennessee and go after your smallest balance first and celebrate cutting that up and burning your credit card statement. If you're someone who's pretty disciplined and is ready to play the balance transfer game, then go after paying your highest rate first. Brian, man, thanks for helping. Hopefully today a lot of people get get out of debt, handle their debt better. I know, by the way, that you guys aren't standing still. You also know there's only a couple people that listen to the show. So <laughs> your secret's safe with us, man. Do you have anything coming up at Magnify Money that you're not really allowed to talk about, but that we can just, the two of us, maybe talk about? You know, we're looking at getting people some more advice on picking a stockbroker, um, and an RIA actually, as well, and helping them. Uh, yeah. Awesome. And they got us looking at that. There's a lot of work behind that, and there's a lot of you know variables and things like that. But because of all the savings authority, when we write about things like brokerage accounts, it tends to do reasonably well. Sure. So they're doing a test to see. All right, let's see if we give people some recommendations on this front, and you know, give them reviews of individual brokers and RIAs. How does how does that perform? Boy, that's that's really cool. And what a pain in the I can just as a former advisor putting that together. <laughs> better, <Yeah. laughs> better you than me, my friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Brian, thanks for hanging out and help people get out of debt. I appreciate it. You bet. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the best part of the podcast. Yeah, my trivia. How'd you like that interview with Brian? I, I didn't listen too closely because I've been debt free forever. My secret, never qualified for a dime in credit in my life. But with that in mind, and as Brian so eloquently pointed out, there's still a lot of debt out there. As it turns out, I don't want to get too morbid here, debt isn't a problem that magically evaporates when you 
finally escape paying taxes. According to Credit.com, Americans leave, on average, $62,000 of debt when they pass away. So with that in mind, here's your trivia question. Which of the following debt categories has the highest debt amount left behind, on average, when someone, you know, kicks it? Auto loans? Possible. Personal loans? Maybe. Student loans? Probably. Or uh, credit card debt? I'll be back with your answer right after this. We hear a lot in the news about Greece being in debt. But actually, when you think about it, we're all in eternal debt to Greece for inventing Greek yogurt. When you try an Aristophanes yogurt, just like the Acropolis, you'll lose your marbles over that smooth Greek taste every time. Aristophanes Yogurts. Keep it Greek. Welcome back, newly minted finance gurus. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And sit back, because it's time for the incredible answer to my trivia question. During the break, I decided to check out if I'm still on the banned list from these credit companies. And as it turns out, one of these suckers is offering me a credit card. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> the interest rates, only 32%. I mean, what do they take me for? I won't accept a dime under 40. Better news, though. Um, let me see here. Credit limit is, uh, oh, wow. That's a that's a really big number. So they're saying I can just go out and spend that? No questions asked? I can buy whatever I want. What? Oh, my God. Sign up now or the offer expires? All right, I got to wrap this up, kids, because I got to finish filling out some forms. Before the break, I asked you this question. Which debt category has the highest average debt amount left unpaid when someone passes away? Uh, Is it auto loans or personal loans, student loans, or credit card debt? The answer, if you said credit card debt, your head's in the right place, but you missed the mark. While credit card debt represents the largest category of debt by percentage, the average unpaid credit card balance was only uh, just a little bit over 4500 bucks. But the correct answer, student loans. I told you, while student loans were only seen in 6% of cases, the average loan amount left unpaid was a little over twenty five k. Wow. Someone remind uh, me to never take on student loans. Credit cards, on the other hand, that's a piece of cake. I'm on my way. See you. I think he needed to listen to Brian's uh, Brian's interview. I love it when we have a guest on and Doug's so busy messing stuff up, decides he's going a different direction. He hears the highlights. <laughs> uh, hey, let's throw out Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, you know what they do? They put what you, not me, but you value first. Well, I'm on day four of my juice cleanse, so I would value a piece of actual chewable food <laughs> more than anything right now. We got to trade Cause, diets because this cause is... you can only drink so much beet as, juice before you just go, all right, something's got to give. As you know, I'm eating nonstop on my MetPro diet, so whenever you're ready to trade for a while... Sometimes I'm like, I just can't shove more food in my face. They're like, you will eat 32 more grapes. Like, I, I already had 116 of them. I'm so full of grapes. Please then, don't make me eat any more grapes. But, but then I step on the scale and I'm like, I'm done another half pound. Bam. Yep. Okay, more grapes. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Hate it though. I cry the whole time as I'm losing weight. Pain in the ass. Uh, but it's actually your loved ones and your time. And that's why well, they've that's made true. buying life insurance actually simple Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now. Use our link and they know that we sent you stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. Their application is super simple. They've taken all the baloney and gotten rid of it. It's all online. Prices are affordable. They're issued by more than 160 year old insurer, Mass Mutual. So you know that you're not getting just some startup. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, James. Say hi, James. 
Hi, Joe. Hi, OG. You've got James here from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I'm an English guy in uh, New York, so don't be alarmed by my voice. Uh, I do love your show, though, guys, and I, I re regularly listen to you as I run around the Central Park in Manhattan. So keep up the good work. And I know you guys love running. You often, often say how much you like it. Uh, this said, I've got a couple of questions for you. I think they're fairly difficult compared to what you, you potentially answer sometimes. So I hope you might be able to help me. The first question is just around uh, ETFs, and I've heard that diversity is very important. So I was wondering what you think about going into your ETF provider and looking at all of the different categories they have, sort of technology, utilities, etc., and selecting the best performer in each one of those to then invest in. Is that a good strategy and a good way to diversify? My second question for you is pretty quite specific to, to my own case, but on the visa I am on, eventually I'd have to leave the US. And when I come to leave, I've been told that I would receive a 30% penalty for withdrawing my money from my IRA. I'd like to know if there's a way around that and if you've got any advice on that. I know that's quite a difficult one, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to to answer it, but there you go. Anyhow, keep up the good work, guys, and uh, love listening to you. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for the question, James. And uh, yeah, sounds like your average New Yorker there. Got that New York so accent. I was going to say, he said he's an Englishman in New York, which is probably a lot better than a New Yorker. In England, I suppose. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Michigander in, in, in England. That was fun. We went. I got to go back. Got to go back. Well, we have to have a London meetup. That's what we have to do. Yeah, I'm game. Even more fun. I love going to Edinburgh. Let's go all the way up to Scotland. Let's have an Edinburgh meetup. We're starting to like really constrict the meetup. It just might just be you and me. <laughs> Who cares? if we... <laughs> we had a meetup. No one was there, but we got... <laughs> A lot accomplished in but terms of business planning. According to the IRS, we got a ton. According to the IRS, it was a huge deduction. <laughs> Mucho expensive -o. Incredible. By the way, our spouses, kids had to come with us yeah, because we had important Couldn't business planning. Center. Yes, stuff to do. Uh, let's talk about the, the, these are two vastly different questions. Talk about the first one, James, what you're talking about is sector investing. When you look at the sector of utilities, maybe healthcare or technology, James said, uh, look at the best sectors and invest in those. Is that a good way to diversify? Yeah, it's a good way to diversify your money away from you to other people who are not you. No. Um, the thing with sector investing, I think you have to recognize that if you buy, let's say, a large U.S. company mutual fund, you're going to have technology stocks in it. You're going to have real estate stocks in it. You're going to have healthcare stocks in it. You're going to have all sorts of different things in there. So I don't really feel that it's necessary to sector diversify. And I'm using air quotes again. That's more of like sector betting. That's like you just going, I think the healthcare market's going to do well. Well, that's just a different form of market timing. So I would never participate in any of that. And the problem here, OG, I think is, you know, he says, look back and look at the best sectors. Well, w w what does best sector mean? I mean, yeah, by definition, they're going to rotate anyway, right? And that's the benefit of, having, you know, a diversified portfolio of large U.S. companies or small U.S. companies or large international companies or small international companies is that it doesn't matter what sector is happens to do well. If financials do well and utilities do bad, that's okay. You own a little bit of everything. You're not staking your whole net worth on, on one particular thing. We talked about this with our wider roundtable team on Friday a little bit about playing that game, you know, even when it comes to developing markets, like not not sectors as much as picking parts of the world. This is kind of picking a part of the, you know, industrial world like which. Well, so what happens if you if you go buy 10 sector mutual funds? What do you have? The S&P 500. You have an index fund. <laughs> you just have a really expensive and inefficient index fund, you know? And so you're going to experience the index fund return by having that. So I would just save yourself the time and energy and just buy a low cost passive product. I'd be interested to know as somebody who is not from the United States, as you think about your investing, James, and this applies to anybody, I suppose, do you, do you find that you have the same home bias as everyone else? Is your home bias predominantly in James's case, UK or uh, United Kingdom based, 
you know, or because he's in the U.S., is his investments primarily U.S. based? I, I'm just kind of curious about that. But yeah, make sure that you've got some of everything, you know, big, small, U.S., not U.S., so on and so forth. The other part of your question is very, very, very particular. And the question really is around how do I get my money from the United States back to my home country if I'm not a U.S. citizen? And the answer is I have no idea. My gut tells me that you will definitely pay a exit tax, whether that's in the form of um, an income tax or whatever you want to call it. Well, because I don't he, know that 30% is the number. Well, the reason he says 30% OG is because he's talking about his IRA. He's talking about his money that's in a in a U.S.-based retirement fund. So because sure. he's under 59 and a half, I mean, he's going to have... Yeah, but it's the number 30. I mean, oh, the numbers, 10 for the penalty. It that's could right. Be, you know, it could be whatever. anywhere. It could be, it could be, could be more. Person. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I do know that there are a few firms that really specialize in this, and it might be worth... Uh, as that day approaches, contacting one of them. The um, the one that comes to mind, I, I think the the name is Thune, T-H-U-N-E. I've never interacted with them. I've had some clients that have had some interactions with them positively from my questioning them. But um, in any coastal area, right? I mean, in New York, which has got a high population that are not always from the United States, those big, big, big cities are going to have people that uh, specialize in that. So you definitely want to make sure that you have the right information prior to pulling the trigger on it, you know, before you leave. There might be a way to just keep it and say, well, I'll just keep this well, and, this is, and it, then wait until I'm retirement age to have a lower tax rate. That was going to be my thought because when I was a financial advisor working with uh, people that were working here from other countries, we talked about they're in a unique situation where they'll know a little bit about what's going on in the U S they know what's going on in the other place that they're from. I mean, I clients from all over the, all over the world initially. And for those people, I personally thought it was a good idea to just keep money in both countries because you don't want to play the Forex game. The Forex game is where you're betting on currencies, but we do know that in the future, at some point, one's going to be up, one's going to be down. And depending on the time that you need the cash, don't play a betting game. Just look at both of them. And hey, if I've got money in the UK, I got money in the US, which one's doing better against the other one? Pull from that pot later on. So developing those two pots. Now there's there's a cost benefit analysis to that that you want to go through. Is there enough money in that US pot when you leave to make that worthwhile? I don't know. But for some of my clients, that's what I recommended they do. Yeah, I think that uh, this is one of those ones that, um, you know, you don't want to be skating beyond your skis there, so to speak, you know, and make sure that you get some competent help, not two idiots on a podcast. <laughs> we gotta watch One out. idiot on a podcast. Gotta, hey, gotta watch. You can figure out who's who. Hey, easy, easy. Thanks for the question, James. You have a question for us? We both have t-shirts that say, I'm with stupid. <laughs> Pointing right at each other. Thanks for the question. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and uh, we will answer your question. Uh, that was a fun one. I like, I do like James, how different those questions were. And he was right. We had no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's swinging. It. Well, we got the first half right. And I think that the second half, leaving it alone, if you can, I think it's still very good, good advice. I like that too. All right. Hey, last piece of advice is that if you are somebody who's in the U S and hangs out, usually in the U S lives in the U S that's an area that OG knows much, much, much more about than, a little than, bit more. than, wow. than the expat scenario or, or uh, living abroad. OG and his team are taking clients. At this point, they're taking about 40 new clients before they have to close the door again. So if you'd like to schedule a time to talk to him and his team, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG to get in before they have to close the door again for a little while. That's going to do it there. Thanks, everybody, by the way, who's left us a review. We've had so many, so much positivity around the podcast lately. It has been so fun. That last week of the year, the countdown to 2020 was so fun. Also, our Magic 8 Ball, two hours long, OG, on fr on Friday. Two hours. I, I, I was there. I know. <laughs> but, but it was so That's damn fun. Edited. That's the edited version. That it was two hours long. <laughs> That's true. But it was so fun. Yeah. It was. I heard from our numbers person that we had a pretty gosh darn good week a couple weeks ago. We, we've had some of our best days. So if you're new to the show, welcome to the family. 
come join us on Facebook. Uh, we have fun there. If you don't mind a lot of bad dad jokes and a few times a day, we'll talk money. It's a pretty good time. It's a very good time. It's fun to see uh, mom and Gertrude and everybody sharing a few laughs there. In fact, here's the review that mom has on her refrigerator right now. Uh, the awesomest personal finance podcast, five stars from Makura Thief. I discovered the world of personal finance podcast a couple of years ago and binged on a bunch of them. But one can only listen to so many a week, so I had to narrow down to just a few to focus on. I do keep less than 10 personal finance podcasts in my subscriptions, and Stacky Benjamins comes to the very top of my list. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I make sure to put SB to the top of my queue. Combination of Joe's warm humor and dry humor of OG, array of interesting guests, listeners, questions, and answers, funny Doug's trivia, all make up an entertaining podcast that you can still, still actually learn a lot about Life's important aspect, finance. I do appreciate they release three episodes a week instead of just one. Thanks for that, Makura Thief. And mom's got that on the fridge today. She's bragging about Makura Thief today, OG. All right. I take issue with the dry humor, but. <laughs> I understand it's a positive review, but let me set you straight. My humor's <laughs> not dry, okay? Okay? It's not dry. I appreciate the fact you're a fan of the show, but. Thank you. But <laughs> my, my dad, by the way, when we were, uh, well, you know what? I'll tell the story another day. All another right, everybody. Day. Have a great day. We'll see you on Wednesday. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Tell you what, Joe, for those folks paying attention, here's what they learned. First, take a lesson from Brian. You won't become debt-free overnight, but if you stick to your strategies and keep yourself financially grounded, you'll be on a sure path to success with your money. Second, take a lesson from our headlines. 401k? Yeah, do that and more. Plus, there's no need to go to a stripped down broker anymore now that all the big boys have zero fees for trading. But the big lesson? Don't use motivational buzzwords around Joe's mom. Apparently, she isn't incentivized to move the needle on making more cookies, a deliverable that's clearly in her wheelhouse. Maybe if we told her this was low-hanging fruit, she'd drill down more and use this opportunity to amplify this amazing opportunity. Know what I mean? Hell, I barely know what I mean. Special thanks to Brian Kareemzad for stopping by the basement. You can find more from Brian through our link at, you know, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Well, if you're new to the you show, <laughs> if you're new to the show, we call this the after show. This is where we tell the stories that are barely relevant. But when I was in high school, I weighed a lot less and I was a fairly good cross country and track runner. But I'm the same person now that I was then on the inside. And OG knows this. OG's like, hey, so how's the show going? 
And I'll start talking for like 40 minutes and I'll realize that he zoned out about 29 minutes ago. I never zone out when I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's my New Year's resolution. To try to keep... To not zone out. Try to keep looking at me in the eye and nodding the whole time you're not paying attention. Yeah. I've got this whole contraption set up where I can like scroll Instagram <laughs> without you noticing. <laughs> I have a family member, by the way, I do that with not scroll Instagram, but I look at her the whole time and I just go, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, I can't wait to get out of this conversation. So and you're looking at me like that, it's right? Not nice to, it's not nice to talk to you about your wife like that. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. yeah, not, definitely not. But at the end of cross country meets, I would have people come up to me and they'd say, hey, Joe, nice race. And I'm standing with my parents and I'd say, well, you know, the first mile was pretty good, but the second mile, you know, I felt like a NASCAR driver at the end of the, the end of the race. Well, you know, we got into that middle portion. Well, there, my I, uh, sponsors, Nike, uh, <laughs> really got some really great running shoes uh, without Nike support. There's no way that we've been able to put this race together. Uh, Adidas did a great job on the, uh, on the leisure wear today. So it kept me nice and warm during the warm up. Uh, kept my muscles. I was worried about that second mile because I felt like a little, a little tough, but I don't know what happened. I got there to mile three and I, and I saw that opening and I just knew that if I could just hold on for another mile, like it would be good. And what, and I just go on and on. Cause I like dissecting the race. I, I still think I think it's fun to dissect. Hey, if you ever want to know about, if you ever want to talk about making a podcast, I will bore you silly about mm -hmm. like making a podcast. So my dad, my dad took me aside afterwards and he puts his, hand on my shoulder and goes, Joe, here's how you answer that question. When people say nice race, you look him in the eye and you say, thank you. And then you walk away. That's where this is going from the review. It, yes. That's where I'm trying it was to going. tie this all together. I'm trying to tie it to you going dry humor. Just OG patting um, you on the shoulder. Just ju say thank you. Just say thank you. Gotcha. So I have a, uh, we were talking about credit cards and the Christmas credit card conundrum. You're right. The, the like, Oh boy, here it comes. The hammer's <laughs> dropping. I have a new way. This is amazing. You're going to love it to not owe anything on credit cards. Don't buy this stuff. No, no, that's not good. <laughs> so what you do is you prepay for a vacation that you really want to take. And then you find out two weeks before the vacation that you can't take it because oh, the no. you want your kids. And thankfully, although it wasn't refundable, we sweet talked them into refunding it. Oh, so no. this whole trip plus, plus for like the first time ever, I booked tickets on Southwest because the American tickets were just like ridiculously expensive, like seven times more expensive. And I didn't know this, but Southwest refunds your tickets also. Wow. So, so my credit card statement has a gigantic credit on it right now from this trip that I bought in September, which basically wipes out all of our spending for December. So it looks like I'm rich. You're a genius. <laughs> it is, looks like I'm super. Basically, I paid for Christmas in September. Is this your big Dominique Creme vacation? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. People that were here last year know that. OG went to this phenomenal cooking thing. Probably my favorite thing that I've ever done. It cost as a vacation. It cost about the same as a third of a Disney vacation, which means it was 16 bags of money. <laughs> <laughs> it actually I actually don't think it's that bad. I mean, yeah. It was it was not inexpensive, but no. I, I know people that I mean for everything that was included I thought that it was a pretty fair well price. that's what I'm the, the stories you came back with were phenomenal and it's I don't know for me it's cost benefit it sounds like the cost was a little high but the benefit was huge that's super awesome yeah 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 so we were looking forward to go and that would have been next week oh that sucks and, yeah so sucks worse for my mom because she's not feeling well but um you know, it's one of those like disappointing things. You're like, do I get mad? Do I feel upset? I'm not the one that's really sick. So I guess I can't be too upset about it, but I can be disappointed. Right. You know? So, yeah. Anyway, so that's my uh, Christmas credit card hack. <laughs> just refund a whole bunch of crap in January <laughs> and just, just get rid of that kick-ass vacation that you prepaid. Just, yeah. Bada boom, yeah, yeah. bada bing.
you end up with like, well, first of all, make sure the kick-ass vacation is refundable because when we called them originally, it was through uh, JP Morgan. And when we called, uh, when we called them, they're like, oh, yeah, that's not refundable. We're like, yeah, I know. Can we talk to somebody else? And finally, we got to the guy who manages it, who is like the host when you get there. We yeah. finally talked to him. Yeah. And he's like totally like, oh, Mr. and Mrs. OG was just looking really looking for Like just totally the the host, right? He knew we were coming. He doesn't know us. Yeah. But he saw the list that would have been our second time, you know. And so he's like, well, we were looking for We had this whole thing. I, this agenda was perfect. And, right. you know, what's going on? And, you know, we told him. And he's like, gosh, it's really, I'll tell you what. We have a wait list. I'm going to refund it. I hope you can make it next year. So you know, it's we're funny. Actually, we're really lucked out. I think I was going to say though, when he did that, you're way more likely to come back next year. No, oh, absolutely. Far more yeah. likely. Yeah. And I'm sure he did have a wait list oh, right? because mm-hmm. of the packaging. So that it's like a little package that they sell and it sells out pretty quickly. So <laughs> my guess is, is that he did have a wait list and he could have been a jack wagon about it. Yeah. And also then filled it with the wait list. You know, or he did the right thing, I think, and said, I'll do this. So, well, it's actually um, funny you said that because I got this call yesterday that said that I could actually go. <laughs> you, got, you, got a, you got an invitation <laughs> to the Cayman Cookout? <laughs> idiot out of Dallas couldn't make it. So, yeah. uh, so, so uh, if you could do the podcast next week for me, that'd be great. You could be a little busy that'd for a few days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. 